We're in hard times and some of us are going to need a lawyer. And if you need a lawyer, don't just react to a TV commercial. Get a copy of the Lawyer's Consumer Directory, which is available absolutely free of charge at any 7-Eleven store throughout Central Florida. The Lawyer's Consumer Directory is going to give you real hardcore knowledge on how to hire a lawyer and a lot of information on issues like bankruptcy, foreclosure, and more. Get the Lawyer's Consumer Directory. It's absolutely free of charge at any 7-Eleven throughout Central Florida. The Christian Star began as a newspaper whose news focus of interest was of Christians. But it's become a lot more than that, covering issues of concerns to our community, covering issues of national, state, local, and political agendas that affect us today. The Christian Star is available free at any 7-Eleven store. So pick up your copy of the Christian Star Bilingual free at 7-Eleven today. Ahora puedes demostrar tu orgullo hispano mientras manejas en la carretera con la nueva tablilla o placa de auto hispana conmemorando los 500 años del descubrimiento de Florida por Juan Ponce de León. Obtén tu tablilla hispana este año y harás la diferencia. Solo mil se necesitan para hacerla permanente. Su donativo ayudará a estudiantes con becas. Nuestra comunidad se beneficiará con más programas y servicios. Resalta nuestra cultura, nuestras raíces. Demostremos que la unión está a la fuerza. Obtén tu tablilla hispana en el departamento de vehículos de motor más cercano o llama hoy al 321-277-0850. Hi, I'm Danny Ramos and welcome to this week's edition of Hispanic Speak Out TV brought to you for the past 12 years on Bright House Cable Channel 49. Um, we're here to talk about something we've talked about before. It involves Orange County and a lot of other counties across the country, and that's redistricting. If you remember, we had a campaign not too long ago in Orange County where um, Damiani was running an existing commissioner appointed by the governor, and uh, he set up a redistricting plan uh, with a man called Fernandez to uh, break up the Hispanic vote. And at that time, we were shouting out that that's a KKK policy because redistricting and eliminating minorities uh, from a voting plan is called cracking. And the KKK used to do that in the 40s, 50s, and 60s in order to eliminate blacks and Hispanics from being elected. Um, we're here today uh, to discuss that and other issues. And uh, our friend here is Juan Cartagena from Latino Justice in New York City. Welcome, Juan. ¿Cómo está? Un placer okay, tenerte. Gracias. Gracias. And Jose Miranda, who's been our co-host now for a long time. Jose, welcome. Okay, okay why don't you start off, Jose? Well, uh, let's start right, right from sure. the get-go, okay? Juan, uh, of course, welcome to the show and stuff. Uh, Thank you. Why are you getting involved in, in the Florida issue of redistricting? Redistricting is actually the ultimate decision-maker about who actually gets to the plate, to play this, the central role of deciding issues of budget, issues of uh, political power, and issues affect the entire community. It is one thing to establish the right to vote. It is one thing to ensure that our people and communities are able to exercise their right to vote, even if they need assistance in Spanish and know how to pull a lever. It's one thing to make sure they're not intimidated at the polls. Mm -hmm. It's one thing to make sure that every eligible person is actually coming out to vote. But ultimately speaking, we're voting for candidates. And those candidates are able to exert the, and represent the political will of the people who vote for them if they're at the table. Redistricting is that incredible political exercise, political with all capital letters. It is the ultimate political game. It's the party in power wanting to keep the party out of power from getting power. It's the incumbents protecting themselves, trying to keep challenges out. It, it happens every 10 years. We're still talking about redistricting in Orange County in 2013 because the census data from 2010 demonstrated one very important things in Florida. First, Florida grew. You all know this, right? Florida enhanced its power right. to congressional seats. The whole country is looking at Florida, looking at Texas, looking at and California. But Texas grew by four seats, right. Florida by two. The reason it grew is because of the influx of many people coming to the state. Now, the reason, of course, when you scratch the surface is that many people are coming to central Florida. So central Florida accounts for as close to 60% of the entire population growth. And when you look at all the population growth from the 20, 2000 to 2010, about 57% is Latinos, Hispanics who are coming to Florida. Right. So therefore, now the question is, 
Do redistricting plans, the ones that were just adopted in the last year or so, do they reflect that demographic reality? Or I should say, do they reflect the new demographic reality? Mm -hmm. And when people in power see new people coming in, they will tend to assert their political will and stop districts from being reflective of that new demographic. Can we, can, can the powers that be take redistricting and say this is a, this district will be all white, this will be all black, this will be all green, this will be all blue? Can they, no. can they do it like that? No. They won't be able to do it like that because, first of all, districts have to be equal in size, Okay. number one, two, and they have to comport to some traditional criteria. They shouldn't look like, they, like, like splots of paint on a map. Okay. They should look relatively compact. They mm -hmm. should follow criteria. They should also, in many cases, follow political subdivisions. Right. Nonetheless, in order to comply with the Voting Rights Act, and we know the Voting Rights Act is critical for Latinos just as it is for African Americans and Asian right. Americans and Native Americans, in order to comply with the Voting Rights Act, you must know what the demographics are of your new districts. It's not like you can ignore it. Okay. You have to be able to say to the world and to a court if you're challenged, Yes, we created opportunities for Hispanics who are here in Orange County. We created opportunities for African Americans who are here in Orange County. In the absence of the demographic data, you wouldn't be able to make that assessment. So yes, they, you take those matters into account, but you can never really draw strictly black, strictly Latino, strictly white districts. So, are, so we can honestly sit down, redistricting is, the, is to create an opportunity for everyone to vote? Yes, it's to create the opportunity so that our votes together can equal, equal political strength. Remember. I can let you vote, but you're gonna, your vote only counts if you and I and Danny get together with people who think like us and vote for somebody who thinks like us. It's the aggregate. See, this is the ultimate. It's one thing to say to the world, I let you come into the voting booth. It's another thing to say, all of you together who think alike can finally elect a candidate of your choice. So we call it vote in the aggregate. It's vote dilution. When I, what, what Orange County was doing and is doing was to dilute the voting strength of Hispanics. When, when, let's talk about Orange County, because that's, that's really our sphere of influence, the Central Florida, the five county area. Um, when Damiani ran, he went to set up the redistricting of Orange County. That was traditionally a Hispanic county. For 16 years, Hispanics were elected to sit in the commission in Orange County. And all of a sudden, that county kept on growing Hispanic, and then they sought to divide it up and move the lines so that the Hispanic population would be distributed to another county? Is that what basically happened? No, what they do is uh, the, the county commission can only distribute the voters within the county of within the same county. So okay. it's not like Osceola benefited from what Orange County did. Okay. But it is that the question is whether or not Orange County fairly redistricted the, the population that was consistently within Orange County. And there was an argument to be made that when you reduce the is proportion of Hispanics in the largest of all the districts that had Hispanic population, especially when the census tells you Hispanics have grown. How did they reduce the... the they reduced it by, by moving the lines. So the okay. populations got shifted into other areas. So you had districts that are so, in the so 40 percentile ranges yeah. next door to another district that was in the, th the high 30s, another 40, okay. as opposed to creating one district that would be a majority Latino district. And okay. that's the issue. Okay. So when, and, and in this particular case, why do you think Orange County and, and Louis Damiani did that? Why do you think that, that, that they pushed so hard for that redistricting? Well, that's the purpose of the lawsuit. We're because, gonna find out. We're yeah. gonna find out a lawsuit. But the, let, let me give you the general truth. Yeah, yeah. And not speaking necessarily about this particular yeah, issue, yes. but in general, this is what happens. In general, throughout the country, and Latino Justice Pearl Def has been doing these cases in a number of places, uh, in multiple states. Uh, we've, we were active here. Mm -hmm. in Orange County, uh, in Orlando especially. Uh, we brought a, a bilingual suit over in Volusia County, not too far from here. Uh, we've been active in Tampa with Hispanics over there, making mm -hmm. sure that they get fair lines. And we brought, along with other lawyers, uh, just a recent challenge to Florida's purge of voters. But what we did here in Orange County was to create this, we created the framework to establish community education forums so that people can actually get involved in this thing early on. We learned through the community that was asking us to get involved that they wanted to have an Hispanic majority state senatorial district, that they wanted to have, create, if possible, a Latino majority congressional district. And we were giving plans. We produce, we got the, we have the wherewithal, we have the technical hard, hardware and software to get it done. Mm. 
What we do in these kind of cases is create the plans that community members can say, this is fairly reflective of what we want. This is fairly reflective of what we see in our communities. Mm -hmm. Then the question is, when you're asking, what is it that forces the other side or the people who are incumbents to actually say no, mm -hmm. a lot of it has to do with who might get elected, who might be protected. All of redistricting is classic incumbent protection. It literally says to the incumbents, who are the ones who usually vote on the plans, mm -hmm. how are you going to draw these plans across the board? How are you going to draw it over a period of years and making sure that the incumbents have a fair chance of getting reelected? So in many times, when you're asking the ultimate question in 99 of 100 cases throughout the United, United States is this. Since the incumbents are the ones who vote for the plans, they will adopt plans that are in their favor. It's, it's classic incumbency protection. Mm -hmm. So when you have a change in demographic, as we've had here in Orange for the last 10 years, mm -hmm. that bumps up. Those two, those two principles coincide, mm -hmm. they clash. How do you create a plan that's fair for the newest populations, and how do you create a plan that's, that's going to result in incumbency protection? Mm -hmm. I suspect that what happened in Orange is typical what happened in many other places. They made decisions based on what they thought was the political benefit of having those people who were voting for these lines in power for another term, as opposed to making lines that would give a fair opportunity for newest members of the county. But it would seem if you do it, as you suggest, in the redistricting fashion, mm -hmm. you can get continue to get elected the same people, the same party in power almost yes. indefinitely, yes. right? Yes, yes, and but so redistricting requires you to shift the lines, and once you shift the lines, you got new aggregations of people, and those new aggregations, those new collection of individual voters, individual voters can actually change who can get elected. So we're, we're seeing redistricting as the ultimate, how do you create a system for the next 10 years right. that will decide who represents whom. Mm -hmm. Is this racist? It can be. Hold it, uh, hold it. But it can be, it can but be. of course. We're gonna take a little it. break, okay? okay? And we'll come back with that question, is it racist in one second after the commercial break? Okay, we'll be right back. We're in hard times and some of us are gonna need a lawyer. And if you need a lawyer, don't just react to a TV commercial. Get a copy of the Lawyer's Consumer Directory, which is available absolutely free of charge at any 7-Eleven store throughout Central Florida. The Lawyer's Consumer Directory is gonna give you real hardcore knowledge on how to hire a lawyer and a lot of information on issues like bankruptcy, foreclosure, and more. Get the Lawyer's Consumer Directory. It's absolutely free of charge at any 7-Eleven throughout Central Florida. The Christian Star began as a newspaper whose news focus of interest was of Christians. But it's become a lot more than that, covering issues of concerns to our community, covering issues of national, state, local, and political agendas that affect us today. The Christian Star is available free at any 7-Eleven store. So pick up your copy of the Christian Star Bilingo free at 7-Eleven today. Ahora puedes demostrar tu orgullo hispano mientras manejas en la carretera con la nueva tablilla o placa de auto hispana conmemorando los 500 años del descubrimiento de Florida por Juan Ponce de León. Obtén tu tablilla hispana este año y harás la diferencia. Nuestra comunidad se beneficiará con más programas y servicios. Resalta nuestra cultura, nuestras raíces. Welcome back. This is Danny Ramos on Hispanic Speak Out TV. We're talking about redistricting, and we have uh, with us uh, Jose Miranda, who is our co-host for the show, and Juan Cartagena, who is the president of Latino Justice from New York City. And um, Juan is the guy who runs around the country and sues a lot of people when he thinks that people are unfairly being treated when it comes to voting. Well, Juan, we, you just asked the question, is, is, is it, it racist? Yeah, is, the vote, is, is this redistricting? The, the way it's set up, the way it, it, it seems to be set up, can it be construed as a, a racist uh, uh, program? It's a very good question. Let, let, let me tell you exactly what the law requires us to prove. The law does not require us to prove that the individual commission members who actually voted in favor of the plan that we're challenging, right. that they had racist intents, that they're bigots, that they're racist, okay. that they're Ku Klux Klaners. It doesn't really ask us to prove that. Right. And, good for, and for good reason, because in many ways, as much as we want to focus on people who make decisions based on racist thinking right. or stereotypes, the bottom line is, does the plan result, does it have the same result, whether it was motivated by race or right. not? Does it result in fencing out new Hispanics who are coming here? That is a results test. And by, by law, what we call Section 2 of the Voter Rights Act, 
would allow us to win this lawsuit just by showing that the results are such that Hispanics do not have the same mm -hmm. opportunity as whites to elect candidates of their choice. And now let me, let me focus on those last magic words. To elect candidates of their choice. The Voting Rights Act does not require that districts be created so that only Hispanics can get elected. The Voting Rights Act requires that Hispanic voters have a chance to choose whoever they want. Okay. If they want to choose somebody white, Afro-American, right. Asian-American is their choice. They right. choose Hispanics, it's fine too. Right. But the bottom line is we have to be able to demonstrate in court that the result of the action fences out, minimizes, and otherwise suppresses the voting strength of Hispanics in Orange County. Right. Right. When that's you the say the result of the action, you're talking about the result of the redistricting? That's right. The actual redistricting plan finally adopted. Right. Yes, correct. Okay. So whatever Damiani was thinking, wanted to do, whatever his cohorts wanted to do in real life, yeah. is it, it's... It would be wonderful to show that they were racist to the core, right. but ultimately speaking, we'd have to work, uh, go that far. I have to be able to show that Hispanics are prepared to elect candidates of their choice. They've been cohesive in the past. They look for ways to mm -hmm. organize amongst themselves. I have to be able to show that people who are not Hispanic tend, tend to vote against Hispanic candidates when given a choice. I have to show that the distinct plan, the map itself, is, looks compact, equal population. Well, that that, that sounds like a slam dunk for Orange County to me. It should be, but we'll because, see. Because, you know, it, it, the history of Orange County right. has been Hispanic well, do, in, in do, the commissioner's seat. Do they come along and say, for example, the three of us, let's say you're Hispanic, you're, you're Asian American, I'm whatever, okay? Mm -hmm. And I say to you, I want to make the world really good for you. I'm going to give this section to you, and you're going to be happy. I'm going to give you this section, and you're going to be happy, and I'm going to get mine. Does that make the world right now? No. Um, Bottom line is, redistricting really just follows geographic housing patterns. Okay. okay, so let's be real. If Hispanics are not subject to housing segregation, or stated another way, if Hispanics are just found equally populated in every block of every street of every road in Orange County, okay. according to their population of the whole county, so every time you turn around, there's a street, there's at least one or two Hispanics. And you, and you, and you can say that for an entire county, which I, I, I'm positive you cannot. Then how would you do a district for just Hispanics, right? It's, the districts are drawn based on where they live. And if Hispanics live in concentrated areas, or in other words, if they live in segregated housing patterns, then the district's going to reflect that. So when you say give one to so-and-so, give one to another, it doesn't work that clearly. It's not, that, it's not a quick line from A to B. However, if in fact there are clear, clear Asian communities in Orange County, you know, enclaves, barrios that right. are theirs. If there are clear, clear sections of Orange County that are black, clear ones, you do, everyone knows where they are. Right. People know the boundaries. Then those districts should reflect those issues because mm -hmm. we follow the housing. Right. So bottom line is we are looking for ways that the districting part actually reflects the reality of the new demographic in Orange County. But ultimately speaking, we win this lawsuit, it still doesn't solve the ultimate question. The ultimate question is, are Hispanics going to get together? Are they going to get together and vote for people that, they, that represent their interests? Are they going to run candidates? Are they going to uh, get together and, and support economically and otherwise the candidates? And, fi and final line is, whoever is the district representative, is that district representative going to be accountable for Hispanic interests? Well, you know, that... And I, and I can't solve that. Well, in I can create the opportunity in the lawsuit, right, right. but I can't create the ultimate, and that is that you have a person who actually represents those interests and is doing a good job and is accountable to so the So it falls team. back to the to Latino community exactly. to step up. That's right. Okay, well, so in Orange you, County, they've stepped up. They were, they've, they've been electing a Hispanic there for 16 years. Every election for, the, for a decade, almost going on to two decades, right. they elected Hispanics because they had enough Hispanics voting together to elect a Hispanic. And the last person in there was Mildred Fernandez, which she dropped the shoe when she was uh, arrested. Yeah. But people saw that as an opportunity and a weakness, and they moved in. Now, I don't know why and what it got it. I, you want to know something? I would bet that Damiani would have won if he would have left the district lines alone, and he would have um, cooperated with the Hispanic leadership. Okay. You know, I think he would have won. How, how does the community, you know, how, 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 how does the community now um, you're about to open the door mm -hmm. to to go to go back to a change that allows for uh, participation. How how do we as the, the community help in that cause? Oh, definitely. That's an excellent question. First of all, 
we have to pay attention to these elections when they occur. We shouldn't assume that elections is just for people who otherwise don't make a difference in our own lives. Or we see the headlines of somebody getting arrested, we think all politicians are corrupt. That's the wrong attitude to have. We spend enormous amounts of energy in my office in Latino Justice to make sure that Latinos have the right to vote and can exercise their right to vote and collectively represent themselves in districts that are fair. But we're doing so part and parcel of a long history of the right to vote in this country that goes back to the days in which we were trying to make sure that everybody can vote who's eligible to vote. But the, as you all know, the history of voting in this country is a history of exclusion because we're talking about membership here. And people fight about membership. Yeah. So now that we finally get to a point where America is changing demographically and racially, we're getting to a point in which we're able to assert what is, fa what is fairly among Hispanics a right to be represented at the same level that they are otherwise in the population. Mm -hmm. So what I'm asking you to understand is that the whole issue of, of the districts themselves will allow for the opportunity, for, uh, that, uh, that opportunity. But ultimately speaking, the community has to pay attention to elections. The, our community should be aware of this law students' developments that will be getting the word out you know, mm -hmm. very soon and, uh, and to other means. Our community should also be aware of the fact that that when things happen at the voting booth, we sh uh, people should know about it. Right. My organization is always interested in finding out whether somebody was stopped from voting because of some ridiculous no you know, notion about you can't, no one don't understand English, uh, intimidation at the polls, the polling site gets changed at the last minute. Those kind of things all impact. And we're looking for ways to make sure that the Hispanics of, of this part of Florida, of Central Florida, or all the counties in Central Florida, are treated with the same dignity and respect that we expect all of us should be treated with. Hispanics, uh, or, well, most groups when they come into the country for, since the immigration started into the United States, cluster. They all cluster. Hispanics are no different in today's world. Sure. Hispanics, whether in New York or whether in Florida, they cluster when they migrate or immigrate into the country or from another state. Is that clustering process supported by redistricting um, preventing or assimilation into the mainstream American culture? Not necessarily. Um, there is a school of thought that says that you should redistrict in a way that actually spreads out those minority populations in many, many districts. And that way they can influence who gets elected in many, mm -hmm. many, many districts. And there's another school of thought that says you ought to make sure that the districts are safe. Safe enough so they can actually elect somebody of their choice. You should know that it's the unfortunate, sad truth in the United States that many Hispanics who get elected, and this is very, very true at the congressional level, Many Hispanics who get elected only get elected from majority Hispanic districts. In other words, when they run in districts that are not majority, they tend to be voted down. Like urban centers. Right. There are exceptions to that rule. You will hear of individuals who get who are incredibly adept at making coalitions with other people who are mm -hmm. not of their race and not of their ethnicities. And you hear that all the time. There are definitely exceptions to the rule. But ultimately speaking, we have yet to create a system of dealing with what we call racially polarized voting. So racially polarized voting is the phenomenon that's proven by social scientists, scientists. The phenomenon that says that the biggest predictive value of who gets elected is the race of the voter vis-a-vis -vis the race of the candidates they have to choose mm -hmm. from. So that in general, we're looking at, in general, polarized voting results in white folk not voting for Hispanics or blacks, mm -hmm. but voting for whites. Even though they're in their district. <clears throat> yes. And that's why, that's why when you look at that that phenomenon, which, we, which is part of the proof in our case as well, when you start scratching the surface of that phenomenon, you start recognizing that a lot of things can be very, very predictive of who gets elected. Isn't of that course, a lot of money, excuse me, yeah, a lot of money, yeah. definitely. I mean, whoever spends the most money typically yeah, gets elected. Yeah, yeah. And incumbents, incumbents, people who are running for re-election, mm -hmm. typically get elected. But race and ethnicity is also another big factor. Isn't, okay, so now you have, let's say, in Osceola County, you have Kissimmee, you have a Puerto Rican guy running in the Puerto Rican community. He's going to get elected, okay? Now he goes for a bigger shot where the Hispanics only represent a smaller 20% of the district. He doesn't get elected. Isn't that part of the assimilation process where maybe his son will get elected or maybe, I mean, it, it all makes sense that, you know, when you have an, a migrating group, they'll cluster, they'll elect their own guy. Right. And eventually that'll start to dissipate, which well, is happening with the Cuban community in Miami. The second and third generation Cubans they started to go out. There's a development 
No, if, if your point is well taken because there's a political development that happens in all our communities. So all emerging communities will cluster. Mm -hmm. When they have representatives, they mm -hmm. usually come from those neighborhoods and those barrios and those clusters. That when, when, those neighbor, when those representatives do step out and try to represent the larger community, they will get, you know, occasionally broken, step down. But here's where, what I want you to ask, and your, your viewers should be asking yourselves. The question for that individual who, from Kissimmee that you give me the example of, the real question is whether or not he speaks to the issues. Mm -hmm. Is he a good candidate? on the issues that would affect all those individuals. And should he be voted upon whether or not he speaks on the issues as opposed to his face of ethnicity? Mm -hmm. So in other words, if I'm the voter who doesn't know him that well and only hears of his position on uh, paid sick leave, mm -hmm. you guys have been talking about that here in Orange County, I hear for a while, it, on paid sick leave, I should be able to vote on that person's position on issues and put aside the issue of his face or ethnicity. Right. And that's mm -hmm. the ultimate, I think, uh, ultimate, goal. ultimate goal of democracy. Right. Wow. Um, Go back to your background a little bit. Why did you get involved with it? I mean, there's thousands of, thousands of lawyers out there handling cases every day. What makes you unique to, to, hand, to get into this mix? Well, first of all, I represent an organization that's been doing this kind of work for 40 years. We just celebrated our 40 years in 2012. Um, we were originally the Puerto Rican Legal Defense and Education Fund. We're now Latino Justice Pearl Def, and we've been doing this for a long time. We see the opportunities in this country as en enormously potential for all Hispanics throughout the country. But we also see the barriers. And I will not rest until those barriers are knocked down. Because ultimately speaking, our kids and our, and our grandkids want to live in a world where everyone is treated based on their merits and not just based on stereotypes. Right. And that's okay. why I do the work I do. Okay. And did you file the lawsuit against Orange County already? It's, it's called Rios Andino versus Orange County. It's currently in federal court. Okay. Right here in Orlando, uh, I can't speak to the details because it's still pending. Sure. But it's, uh, we'll see what happens, and it's, it's one of the suits that we have here, among others in Florida. And how long will that Orange County process lawsuit take? What is the story? Justice standard? works and slowly. slowly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've already filed. Long, I hope nobody's in jail on it. <laughs> <laughs> we filed the suit already. It's been at least, uh, my recollection is close to a year already. Okay. I suspect another two or three. So years. we're talking politics here. That's what we're talking about. It being slow. Because yeah, the law itself yeah. it, it, Jose, it's, it's clear. Uh, yeah. Jose, we ran out of time. <laughs> All right. We're out of time. The subject was redistricting, and we did a little recap on Orange County and what's coming up, a lawsuit against Orange County um, by Latino Justice. Uh, we will be back next week. This is Danny Ramos on Hispanic Speak Out and with Jose Miranda. And uh, thank you, Juan Cartagena. Thank you. Placer. Igual, Muchas igual. Gracias. Gracias. We'll see you next week, same place, same time. hard times and some of us are going to need a lawyer. And if you need a lawyer, don't just react to a TV commercial. Get a copy of the Lawyer's Consumer Directory, which is available absolutely free of charge at any 7-Eleven store throughout Central Florida. The Lawyer's Consumer Directory is going to give you real hardcore knowledge on how to hire a lawyer and a lot of information on issues like bankruptcy, foreclosure, and more. Get the Lawyer's Consumer Directory. It's absolutely free of charge at any 7-Eleven throughout Central Florida. The Christian Star began as a newspaper whose news focus of interest was of Christians, but it's become a lot more than that, covering issues of concerns to our community, covering issues of national, state, local, and political agendas that affect us today. The Christian Star is available free at any 7-Eleven store, so pick up your copy of the Christian Star Bilingual free at 7-Eleven today. Ahora puedes demostrar tu orgullo hispano mientras manejas en la carretera con la nueva tablilla o placa de auto hispana conmemorando los 500 años del descubrimiento de Florida por Juan Ponce de León. Obtén tu tablilla hispana este año y harás la diferencia. Nuestra comunidad se beneficiará con más programas y servicios. Resalta nuestra cultura, nuestras raíces. 